Okay, so I think we can start now. I'd like to ask everyone but Max to switch their microphone off, but I see that uh, nearly everyone is the microphone switched off with the exception of William. William, can you please switch the microphone off? Uh, and uh, I think we can start. Max, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thanks guys. So just thanks for inviting me to, to do this. Uh, so it's, I just want to do a really quick overview. I should last about, I guess, 50 minutes or so and interrupt me at any time with questions on uh, the current state of brain machine interfacing. And brain machine interfacing is the same thing as brain computer interfacing, which means the same thing as neural prosthetics. So um, let's go right in to uh, kind of a quick overview of the modern approaches. So in general, a, a BMI is either invasive or non-invasive. And the, the non-invasive approaches, the three big ones are electromyography, electroencephalography, and fMRI. And for various reasons, none of these are really interesting. So you have emotive systems with the most famous EEG, and then here's a picture of what fMRI is, except that they, they're all really fundamentally crippled, so you have to go, you have to go invasive if you're going to do for, like really interesting work. So EMG is just really not what we mean by BMI if we want to uh, re-embody locked-in patients. And it, by the way, is, am I being followed, or is there, can people still hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. So just make sure. Okay. EEG has what's known as the inverse EEG problem, which is the idea that the skull dramatically distorts the signal, and it's very coarse, and it's really fundamentally looking at the wrong signal because it's characterized in terms of its frequency content, and this, for various reasons, just really isn't practically useful for uh, BMIs for control. And then fMRI is, it has poor spatiotemporal resolution, it gets its signal on a lag of about a second to a couple seconds. It is has resolution no better than a like a couple millimeters square, and it makes a lot of big assumptions. Namely, the biggest one is that blood flow is related to spiking activity, and blood flow is what it what it measures. So there's a there's a group within the scientific community that holds basically that all fMRI is basically useless. So that's that's an ongoing controversy that I'm not really going to remark on. But needless to say, most of the proper BMI work that's done is invasive. So there's uh, three major veins in this, and they, these don't all overlap, but kind of the four major methods that are used are electrocorticography, microwire multi-electric arrays, optogenetic stimulation methods, and voltage-sensitive dyes. Now, these don't all overlap because they don't all provide for the same thing. For example, optogenetics doesn't record, voltage-sensitive dyes don't stimulate, but they're the th four major tools. So ECOG is basically EEG except under the skull. It solves the it solves the inverse EEG problem with a horrifying craniotomy. Um, and optogenetics it uses light to stimulate a uh, light to stimulate cells. So there's a diagram here. Uh, blue laser light opens as a protein in the surface of the cell and causes sodium to flow in. Uh, so there's ECOG is a high resolution EEG. Uh, Microwire to electrode arrays, which are the, the main tool used generally in invasive BMI, which involves implanting very fine uh, electrodes into the surface of in, into superficial cortex, has immune response problems, so the brain identifies it as a foreign body that it has to encapsulate and move, and it has scaling problems. You just you can't. You'll never get to millions of cells using microwires. You can't turn the brain into a pincushion. It causes too much damage. And on the other hand, microwires let you both stimulate and record, whereas optogenetics, which is a really cool stimulation technology, doesn't let you record. And we'll come back to, we'll go into both more microwires and optogenetics in a little bit. And then vulture-sensitive dyes are a non-invasive way of doing recording as long as you're like a nematode and you're thin and uh, mostly transparent. So any questions so far? No? I'll give it a second. 
Uh, interesting question. Would carbon nanotubes be off the radar? So there's one of the things that's commonly experimented with are what are the different coatings you can put on microwires to make the immune system ignore them or have other strange effects. And carbon nanotube, so carbon coatings are one of the things that are experimented with. So one of the big companies in this, Plexon Cells, carbon nanotube coated electrodes. Um, as far as I know, they, they don't really solve the problem, though they yeah, they aren't really, they don't seem to be a solution so far. Okay. A lot of, I'll say a lot of the initial Im immune response is a, is actually comes out of the immune, is, comes out of the inflammation response to the implantation surgery. So there's a group within the scientific community that says that if you can make that implantation surgery as, as non-traumatic as possible, so that there's no acute uh, inflammation response, then you could actually mitigate the long-term immune response that leads to the encapsulation of the, uh, the electrodes. So one thing just to keep in mind as we go through this, the bar here is if you can develop a, an invasive BMI with one channel with one degree of freedom, that's it might be a cool technology, but our bar here is the fact that a keyboard is an awfully good BMI that doesn't require brain surgery. So we are pretty well connected to the physical world through the bodies that we have. And that's not true for patient, that for locked in patients for quadriplegics. And they could be a clinical use case for technology that's more immature. But really what we're aiming for here is something that does better than the interfaces we have available, which is a pretty high bar. So I want to spend probably the big bulk of this talk going through the fundamentals of multi electrode array electrophysiology for BMI control because this is what I work on and it's the main thrust in the community right now and it's at the end of it the idea is you should have an understanding of how a BMI is made how like the principles of operation and how we kind of are going about extending it right now so question from Will BrainGate 2.0 allows typing with thoughts, right? So sort of. There's so there's a company called Neural Signals that tried to decode speech activity out of cortex. They they never actually got that far. They had a really cool technology that we'll come to in a minute called a neurotrophic electrode. And all they ended up being able to do is build a Bayesian classifier to look at spiking activity to tell if the patient was imagining speech or not. They never actually got to decoding speech. In so I'm I don't want to make it a strong statement about BrainGate 2.0 because I haven't seen the briefings in a while. But in general, when people talk about decoding uh, typing, what they do is they map it onto motor space. So pretty much all decoding that happens is mapped onto motor space, and they give you a virtual keyboard and then have you drag a virtual cursor over it, and then have some trigger to say select this character. Because uh, as we'll as we'll go over in a couple minutes, decoding motor space has been fairly well understood since the 80s, but there's limits to what we can do with it and we'll certainly need and we'll need well it sort of it sort of works there's long-term problems but uh certainly symbolic decoding which is something we don't understand at all right now is something we're going to need to at least partially figure out before we get to uh, the next generation of bmis so uh this diagram here uh, do you know what stephen hawking uses I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure he has a pre-vocalizer that's basically EMG on the vocal cord, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I'm I'm pretty positive it's not a cortical BMI. So anyway, uh, that diagram is a, what we call a closed loop BMI. So you have So you have public communication coming up through, this is coming out through the micro wires, which then get amplified in, in the, the BMI software proper. Uh, my, my video just disappeared. Am I still here? Okay, I'm back. 
Okay. So the work flow. basically goes you you record the signals you process them you do spike sorting so you do spike sorting to go from channels to neurons then you okay my, my video is going again but I'll, I'll just keep going right now uh, and then you decode based on wait now it says I'm not silent Any, can you guys hear me? No. <clears throat> no. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll just leave my video off for right now, and I'll leave it on on audio. So, uh, okay. So you record the signals. You use. You sort channels into neurons, which we'll touch on in the next in the next slide or the slide after that, and then you use that to construct models of spatial movement. So you can have you can decode a group of of a hundred neurons to give you X Y Z movement in some virtual space, and then you usually feed that back to the subject visually. So you have them playing a task, and you can use that to control the task, and you can also feed back. Uh, you can give them feedback directly to cortex using microstimulation. So you can stimulate back into the brain to effectively write to it. Uh, that's generally mapped onto existing receptive fields in sensory cortex, which we'll come back to. So this is so closely prefers to that we're recording out and we're stimulating back to give them feedback in addition to visual feedback. So some definitions. I, Bet that most of you already know this, but we'll just go through this really quickly. So a spike refers to an action potential. Action potentials are the signals that neurons use to communicate. So a neuron fires an all or nothing potential between, uh, uh, well, so it receives afferent, or it receives input from a large number of cells, all of which are all or nothing. And then it transmits, it, based on this input, it decides to transmit out a spike or not to all the cells that it synapsed onto. This is, okay, we can try it. Can you see me? Julio? Okay, so the brain uses spikes to encode information. So all of the, all of the neural codes come back to spike trains. So a spike train is a series of spikes transmitted by a cell. So if we're listening to a cell, then all of the spikes that it transmits over the course of some time period is a spike train. And spike trains encode uh, hand position, joint forces, cursor velocity. The spike trains are the meaningful units of, or the meaningful pieces of information are called spike sorting. So when you implant microwires in cortex, and actually let me pull up an image really quickly. So on this slide, you can see the Utah uh, picture of a Utah array, and then below it, a custom microwire array. So each of these electrodes, they don't they don't go into cells. They live in the extracellular space. So they're actually picking up on the electrical activity of many cells at once. To convert this to useful uh, to, to get spike trains out of this, you need to first sort your cells. And this is a, like say, kind of roughly magical process by which you look at the waveforms and you say, these look like two different cells. I'm going to sort them into different templates. And then all of your conclusions are based on this. 
one of the big challenges is getting is developing automated spike sorting software that does this reliably because well one of the things that that happens quite often is you'll sort uh, you'll have two different days and you'll sort your cells differently and then you're getting information from different cells from what you think are the same cell or you're calling one cell two different cells because the um, because the waveforms look slightly different to a human there's different tricks you can do like looking at this the waveforms in PCA to try and sort out the different clusters but it's it's really hard so uh, a channel is a microwire so you have a channel which contains multiple cells after spike sorting and brain control refers to decoded activity driving the actuator so when the cursor or robotic arm is actually dri being driven by the decoded activity, we call that brain control. I list in the, this in the definitions because every now and then I'll be talking to someone and I'll casually mention brain control and they'll say, isn't that unethical? How can you control another organism? And then I realize, no, 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 we're talking about two different things. We're not actually controlling the organism, we're letting the organism control uh, the computer. Yeah, so I noticed that at, P at I want to say ASIM, Peter was talking about some very cool spike sorting software that they developed using self-organizing maps. That would, uh, hopefully we'll get a paper out of that soon. <laughs> so I'll just stop for a second to ask if there are any questions before we go to implant technology. Nope. Okay. So the three main the three main types of implants that are used are the Utah probe, which is kind of mass produced and an easy implant surgery. It's also really traumatic. The implant surgery basically launches it into the surface of cortex using an injector, and it's kind of the, the simple, cheap version. Then there's custom microwire arrays that are a bit more fragile, built to order, and they use they penetrate usually two or three layers, and you'll have 16 to 32 uh, channels per implant. Then the other the other type, which is actually really cool, but almost no one uses because it's under patent right now, is called the neurotrophic electrode, which was used in the I I don't want to say brain gate. It was used in the neural signals trials. It's owned by Kennedy. It's, it basically it's a glass micropipette that's filled with a, a solution that encourages neurons or axons to grow up into it. So instead of putting electrical contacts there that then detect the ambient or the, detect the, the electrical activity of the neurons around it, it actually gets the neurons to grow up into it and uh, make themselves nicely available to the electrodes. And it doesn't suffer from a lot of the same immune problems except that Kennedy patented it and basically no one else has touched it since like 2000. So hopefully we'll see more of those in the future though. Uh, so typically you'll implant multiple arrays in one animal. So a couple years ago you were seeing two or three arrays uh, implanted. So in this diagram, premotor, uh, dorsal premotor, uh, primary motor, and primary sensory cortex. Uh, more recently, we're seeing many uh, many errors happen, and the arrays are more dense. So, like you'll see bilateral implants, PMD M1, S1, SMA, maybe posterior parietal. So you're going to get we're now getting many many cells per animal. They're they're still only lasting two or three years because of immune response problems, and that's the primary trade-off that people are thinking about with. Uh, human surgeries. Hold on. It says that I'm speaking loudly. Let me see if I can turn down the microphone a little bit. Um, is that is that better? Okay. Can you still hear me? Okay. Well, if I'm too too soft. Okay. Well, I can turn it back up. That's the problem. All right, so, all right, better? Okay, so 
the the main trade off, the, well, one of the main reasons why this hasn't really moved into humans in a big way yet is because of the immune response problems with microwire electrodes. And if the surgery is high enough risk and uh, invasive enough that you only want to do it if the electrodes are going to last effectively forever. And there will be, even when the electrodes don't have these immune response problems, there will be upgrades to the technology. You'll, you will want to replace them after a couple of years. But we want that to be our decision and we want to be able to build kind of an implant platform that means that we only need to do a really dangerous surgery once or we need to make the surgery cheap and easy, which we'll come back to. Um, but the, so yeah, we're, we're drilling more arrays for animal right now. And when the longevity expands to 10, 15 years, then we'll begin to probably see it more in, in humans. The, also just some labels from this diagram. Here, premotor dorsal and, and primary motor, M1, are two big motor areas. So you, you record out of that if you want to get, uh, for example, hand control, so control the robotic arm, controlling a cursor, that's encoded in, in primary in motor cortex. And then sensory cortex, so we break this out and then we say, and then there's the second half of this diagram is electrode array. You typically stimulate into S1 with electrical microstimulation. So you'll map, well, well, we'll come back to that, but you can map out what are called receptive fields so that we have a, a sense of if we stimulate this electrode in S1, it'll feel like you're being tapped on the finger or brushed on the arm. And we'll come back to that. So the workflow re for reporting looks like you have this. You have, this is called a floating array. You have your array, which is connected to a head stage, which, which is the, the middle largely black blob. And the head stage does preamplification, and it doesn't it doesn't generally do digitization, but they're beginning to. And then that leads off to what's generally called a Harvey box, or really just more broadly a preamplifier and filter. And then that goes into uh, spike sorting. So the, the screenshot here is, is Plexon sort client, where you have each one of the little cells on the right are channels, and they're the neurons on each channel are color coded, and then blown up on the left is one of is one channel here. So you can see that there's four cells that have been sorted on that channel for uh, color coded red, yellow, green, and blue. Blue in the background. The templates are below that, and then below the templates in the bottom left are the spike trains coming off each off each neuron. So each one of the the little vertical uh, lines is a is a spike. I don't know if you can make that out in the image though. Uh, just as a side note, the connectors that are labeled omnetics, they're a very rare, expensive kind of connector, and no one on Earth has as many omnetics as they want. So just throwing that out there, there's kind of been a perpetual joke in, in a, at least Duke that someone's going to start overnight on books.com because they're <laughs> very much in demand and very much overpriced and very hard to get, but everyone uses them. Just as a side note, so the costs for this have changed dramatically over the past couple of years. So Plexon's owned the electrophysiology uh, amplification market for a while, and a Harvey box is not only the size of a rack, but also costs $50,000. Over the past year, um, a researcher named Reed Harrison at University of Utah, which makes the Utah probe, has developed a miniaturized digitizing pre preamp called the Intan. So just, and it's, it's like literally a couple hundred dollars which is unbelievable. So to go back to the other slide really quickly, one of the problems with this uh, this workflow is that the digitization doesn't happen until even after the Harvey box. It happens on a uh, data acquisition card in your desktop. So there's it means that you're way more susceptible to noise. It means that you can transmit fewer channels because there's no concept of really multiplexing off the head stage. So this is all an analog an analog process. Uh, for comparison, these intens, the intens are where the on the they live on the head stage, the, but they also digitize. So then the signal coming upstream is is digital, and you can hypothetically fit way more channels, and you're way less susceptible to noise, and it makes it way easier to transmit wirelessly. So there's a lot of people.
experimenting with the intents. Now they came out early this year, and they're really cool. So to get get into the principle of operation for how decoding works, it's mostly based on the idea of a preferred direction vector, which gives you a tuning curve. This was discovered in the, I want to say, late 80s by Georgeopoulos. And the, the basic idea is that a cell has, is tuned for some, has some preference for what you're talking about. So if you have, in this case, so in this diagram, there's a center out task. So if you can see the little diagram above the raster plot, there's a black blob in the center and the little dots around the periphery and then a crosshair over one of those. So in this kind of task, there's going to be a cursor that starts in the center of the screen and then a target that appears in the periphery and where the cross is in these two. And you're looking at the, the spiking rates for different neurons based on where the target appears. So in uh, on the left side in A, you can see this this cell is tuned very strongly preferentially to the right. So if the target if the target appears on the right side of the screen, this uh, this cell begins to spike at a much elevated rate. If on the other hand it appears on the left side of the screen, this cell, this cell is depressed. The spike the spikes coming off the cell are depressed. And actually, I think I'm I'm lying a little here because this is many cells, but they've really just picked out many cells that are tuned tuned the same. So it's the same idea for, for one cell. So in this, a, the cell is a linear a linear encoder of direction information. So it has this preferred direct preferred vector, and the closer you are to that vector, the more strongly it's going to spike. The the more frequently it's going to spike. So any questions? Or should we keep going? You can also ask all questions at the end. Randall. Okay, so it's it's a really simple idea that is okay. So it's it's a really simple idea that ends up being really powerful. So this just to highlight preferred direction more. So this is we've on the on the right side of the screen the heat plot the heat map. There's this is cast into two dimensions. So you have two D screen space. So uh, this is many many trial. So instead of where the other diagram was one trial, how frequently does it spike? This is uh, for many, many trials where you've covered the whole range of uh, the periphery. Where does it, for which angle does that cell spike the most? And then you end up with diagrams like this, and you can see there's very specifically some uh, direction off to the, some direction that the cell prefers, or some range of directions that the cell prefers the most. And on on the topic of how accurate can you get with this, it's I don't there aren't numbers there aren't R values associated with this plot, but this is the the graph on the left I pull out of a paper pulled out of a paper from the Nicolas lab, which was decoding uh, arm movements out of a joystick task, and as you can see, it, it matches the the red is predicted, the blue is observed, and they match up pretty closely, so you can get pretty good accuracy. You can get point 88.9 r squared with this. And then one thing to touch on, so normally you train, so when you get a monkey you or a human, you train it on a task with either a joystick or paddles or whatever the, uh, whatever the physical analog that you're going to be decoding is for a while. And you get, you get these preferred directions off of the joystick task or the um, a treadmill or dancing floor or whatever, uh, whatever it is that you're watching. So you have to validate that, these, that this preferred direction holds up when you take this away. So you have to make sure that it's mapping intent or uh, sc like screen space versus hand or leg or finger so that uh, do you know how the DARPA brain controlled robotic arm was done? Is that research publicly released? So do you know do you know whose lab? There's so DARPA brain so for example, Duke received DARPA money to do brain controlled robotic arms. I think Schwartz did too. They all work on principle. Um, if you know which lab I can probably 
comment specifically on the on the method. But they they're all pretty much based on the same. Oh, the Luke arm. Ah, okay. So the Luke arm isn't isn't a uh, cortical prosthetic. It's just a robotic arm. It's a really cool robotic arm, so I feel kind of bad saying just a robotic arm, but it's in the videos that you see, it's controlled by foot pedals. So one of the one thing that hasn't been done yet is to do an implantation surgery and uh, control it neurally, which is something you could do, but no one's done yet because of the problems associated with uh, doing invasive BMI in humans and the surgeries. Uh, the, the patients for which you're going to be doing these surgeries today, their problem is not that they've lost an arm. So uh, here well, in, in this figure, it's that the the cells exhibit a preferred direction both when you have when you give them a joystick, which is called pull control, as well as in brain control. So the the this, these receptive fields continue. Right. Next slide. Once you have these preferred directions, we construct well you can make any number of filters. One of the more sophisticated ones is called a Kalman filter, but most general uh, Usually you have, you use a Wiener filter, which is a simple multi-dimensional multi linear regression where it looks like you take a weight vector for each, for the cell that you're looking at, and then the firing rate, and then you add up the, the firing rate at the current time, the smooth firing rate at the current time, and then f the smooth firing rate for any number of what we call taps, which are lags. So... In general, there's a delay. Well, not in general. There's always a delay between the brain and, and arm movement. So the electrical activity that represents move your arm, uh, like pick up an object, will precede the actual movement by a couple milliseconds, by 10 milliseconds or so. So if you want to decode move your arm to pick up that object, you have to be looking at the electrical activity from 15 milliseconds ago, not the electrical activity right then. So we look at uh, look at some uh, history to capture that. Hold on, I'll slow down for a second. All right, am I back? Okay. So uh, doing this at each so at each lag, you have the weight vector and then the the firing activity, and then and this is normalized for the number of taps, and then you add add this up. And this, this gives you the estimate of the intended direction at this time for this activity. And you want to do this over an entire ensemble. So if the, the equation at the top is for one cell, then you need to you vectorize it to solve the entire ensemble at once. So the, uh, oh, that's a typo at the bottom, where Y contains the number of taps plus two columns and the number of cells rows. And then it's uh, basically just nature's math to, to get the, uh, the direction, the vector that you're going to move the cursor. And to go back to one of the other questions about how does speech decoding work or how does talking, it's all back to, it all projects into motor space right now, which is kind of one of the problems that we'll have to cross. So they'll give the patient a virtual keyboard and then decode uh, motor activity like this to drag a virtual cursor around and then have some other signal to say, pick this, pick this character. But there's really no symbolic decoding that's going on right now. It all maps into motor, into motor space. So to write, write it, there are two methods to write information back to the brain right now. The, the most common is called ICMS, or intracortical microstimulation. And the, the basic operating principle is you'll, if you have an electrode array in S1, primary sensory cortex, then you can record, as you're recording out of that area of the brain, you can take the subject's hand or an, another part of the body and although you, you generally know where you're implanting into because there we have a map of S1. And then basically stimulate, uh, mechanically stimulate them in that, uh, in that area. So either tap in like 
the fourth digit, third digit, or on the palm of the hand, and then audiate the neuron. So basically play the electrical activity out over a speaker. And after, and as you search the, through the different channels, so as you look through your different electrodes, as you keep patting the subject on the finger, eventually you'll hear that correlates to when you're touching it. And that tells you that you've identified uh, the cells, that the cell that you're listening to's receptive field uh, is in that area of, um, it maps onto that area of the skin. So then the intuition is that if you stimulate that area, if you stimulate that cell, then you're going to make it feel like they're being patted on the finger or patted on the hand or brushed on the arm. This is probably roughly true. You can't make statements about what it feels like to be the subject, and we haven't really validated this in humans, really. It, well, we, we have indirectly, we haven't done this with intracortical microstimulation. There is other work that's been shown that people will report that it, they feel phantom activity uh, through electrical stimulation like this. So it's it's about, it's probably, probably true. And we can use this to, uh, I mean, most simply, you'll have a, you'll have a cute task. So to have a, here's a joystick uh, and a cursor. Go left or right based on if you feel like you're being touched on the hand or not. Or more co complex is you can actually create entirely new sensors. So one experiment that was done is you'll have rats with um, you can give them magneto sensation by stimulating sensory cortex uh, per, um, in varying at varying frequencies, preferential for different uh, for different angles on a compass. So if the rat is facing north, then you stimulate a couple cells a lot and a couple cells not very much at all. And if they're facing west, then you stimulate different cells and different frequencies. And you can eventually, after a while, they'll just incorporate this sense of north into their representation of like the real world. And sensory cortex will largely remap to incorporate this as if it was a, a sense that's there. There are a bunch of problems associated with ICMS as there are with pretty much every every other method in, in the field right now. So it's the brain is largely wired to seize. So it's it's kind of amazing that we don't have seizures more often. And ICMS can often send them over that threshold and, and induce a small seizure that it resolves on its own, but you really shouldn't be inducing seizures in your animals or in your patients. And also, you charge balance. So, if you notice on the the right side of this figure, the the pulse is charge balanced so that you don't do you don't basically dissolve off the electrode into the brain, but you're still roughly cooking the brain, the tissue proximal to the electrodes. So that's definitely a downside to electrical stimulation. Uh, an alternative is optic microstimulation, which is really cool but much more young, and this uses so you can get, you can cause the neurons to, that match very specific uh, conditions, so that are expressing very specific genes and have very specific environments, to express uh, sur surface proteins that are light responsive. So basically they're the neuron, they're the proteins that are used in the eye to, well, they're not exactly the neurons that are used in the eye, but they're, uh, or proteins that are used in the eye, but they're, it's a similar idea so that they're light responsive to a certain wavelength, and then they open a sodium channel. And the most common is called uh, channel rhodopsin, or CHR2, uh, and it's sensitive to, you can have different uh, channel rhodopsins that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. So then, as in diagram A, you have a implant structure with a fiber optic cable running out, and then a laser of a specific wavelength that you can project into the brain, and you can get pretty good spatial resolution. Not not phenomenal, but you can get pretty good spatial resolution that'll activate only the cells that match the characteristics that you're looking for. So, like, let's say we want to find all of the um, all CA1 cells, CA3 cells of a very specific phenotype. You can get just them to exhibit uh, to express channel rhodopsin, and then you can just stimulate them and nothing else, and you don't have the other problems associated, like with uh, my intracortical microstimulation, it's a very blunt tool. When you stimulate through it, you're going to excite all of the cells anywhere near it, and this lets you be much more specific. But 
not infinitely specific, and you only have a couple different uh, wavelength groups, so you don't have, you can't preferentially stimulate a thousand different groups in a very small area. Another really cool benefit of this actually, in B, so in what's labeled OptoXR here, this is a paper by Dyseroff, who's at Stanford, and him and Ed Boyd are really pioneer in technique. Um, as far as I know, they haven't actually done this yet, but it's certainly something they're thinking about, is not just traditionally, well, so channel Rhodopsis opens a sodium channel, uh, NPHR opens a chlorine channel, but you could actually develop, your, you could engineer your own opsins that are light responsive and, and trigger second messengers. So they trigger more complex interactions within the cell that you can trigger optically that uh, have, to get at mechanisms such as long-term potentiation or other learning effects, which is something that's kind of not, not explored yet, but definitely a big uh, opportunity. All right, next slide. So today, the, the real state of it is that none of the recording technologies that we have get us anywhere near where we really want to go. We really want to get to a world where we have wide, fluid, two-way communication with the brain on the scale of millions of cells, or, or have some have another mechanism such as a synthetic brain area that synapses in so that you don't need access to the cells in, in the existing cells, but you can connect to the entirety of the brain through another area. But the, much less that, we don't have anything that gets us near what the recording technology we want right now. Uh, on top of that, the stuff that we do have requires a really invasive brain surgery. So either we'll need to discover non-invasive methods, or we'll need to make that cheap uh, that surgery really cheap and easy and safe, probably with uh, robotics. Uh, all current decoding projects to motor space. So there's no symbolic BMIs right now. There's no uh, there's no concept of we're going to decode uh, raw intent or speech or like we can't we couldn't decode out a a painting for an artist right now. It, it all comes back to motor space. Uh, although we could decode out kind of movements of a, of a paintbrush. And then fourth, which kind of goes back to three, is there's no, there's absolutely no sharing of recorded ensemble data between labs and the public. This is, so for an experimentalist, their biggest asset is their data. So unless there's, unless the NIH or NSF says, um, I am, One second. I'm not familiar with the INCF, Randall. Um, so, well, one thing that's one thing that's come up is that the NIH should require that everyone that gets, or the government that says that everyone that gets public funding should release their data and their code, which would, if everyone did it, then everyone would be okay. So, if the, the concern, so the two big concerns are one, that if we release our data, which we spent lots of money and time collecting, then someone else is going to use it and publish it and we haven't gained anything, so why am I going to help your career? And the second is um, that someone else is going to look at our data and misinterpret it. And then they're going to write a letter to Nature and say, I don't see how they got the, these results at all, because they misinterpreted the data, which is, like, which would be annoying. So you need some way that you need some system where they can't really misinterpret your data, or everyone needs to be releasing data, so it's everyone's problem. But that's uh, that would definitely advance our understanding of of decoding, although not without better recording technology too. Um, yeah, there's nothing like that. There's so Berkeley tried to release a couple data sets, but really it just just really doesn't happen. So that's uh, questions. So let me, let me pull up INCF in another tab with you. Well, I feel questions. Thanks, guys.
So any research in the area of mapping symbolic info into motor, into motor cortex. Wait, so into motor, so into motor cortex or into motor space? Hmm. So writing information into the brain is also a problem than getting it out. So in general, if you can come up with a representation that involves a preferred direct, a preferred vector, uh, so if you can de compose your problem into a representation that involves preferred vectors, you can pretty much write it into the brain. Um, and you can hypothetically get it out, except that the brain doesn't really want to give it to you like that. So if you stimulate it in, the brain will eventually figure out how to make use of the information. And it will, the brain basically acts as a feature extractor. Uh, and animals will learn an almost arbitrarily complex, well, actually, I don't. So microstimulation actually is really, really poor through, has really poor uh, input. But if you give them a behavioral task, they'll learn an arbitrarily complex mapping. And then there's work, the more interesting work, so Seymour, to your question about uh, symbolic info presentations. The more interesting work there is actually being done in multi-electrode arrays, so in vitro. That's not my area of research, but it's something that I want to say Peter Pissarro knows a lot about and Steve Potter's lab has been doing a lot on, where basically there you only have symbolic representation. that mostly map into motor cortex because you don't have any of the existing pre-existing structures that they map back to. Can you hear me? Yes? Now we can. We had been gone for a while. But uh, not for okay. long, for like five seconds. Okay. Taking so you meant user interface design advantage of recognition of direction of focus. So this isn't this isn't really high level psychological research. Um, that you have dot like ocular dominance columns and this uh, these preferred vectors doesn't typically manifest itself in a way that's useful for high level psychological research. Any research, so Randall asked, do you know any research in which the superposition of signals is attempted in neurons? So, how, so you mean having two different representations in one cell? Or, okay. Um, okay, so let's say you have regular spiking signal. Okay, so let's yeah. So the yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you more about this later. In general, our kind of as you kind of might have inferred, our decoding is pretty primitive relative. Uh, relative to what could be done, so there's so there's two main camps here. There's first is the idea that um, the the frequency is all that matters, the spike rate is all that matters. And there's, there's another that says no, you need the precise timing information. So it doesn't uh, you can't just look at a firing rate average bend at even uh, 100 hertz. You need to look at the precise temporal information and in that scheme, you might you might look at multiple signals with phase shifts, but in general, the current decoding that's actually used is all looking at firing rate, not precise temporal information. So in that sense, it wouldn't make we're not you're not going to see observe any phase shift phase shifting. But I'll ask you more about that later. The new technology that BrainGate is using how is it different from the chip that uh, we showed earlier? So I don't. 
So as far as I know, BrainGate hasn't developed their own head stages. Or, well, one second. The So the BrainGate trial, I, I'm actually, I'm not familiar with BrainGate, so I, I don't want to comment on it. But it's, although we can look at it up briefly. So it looks, it is. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with BrainGate 2. The, I've, I saw BrainGate 1, which used a uh, standard array and analog amplification system, but I'm not familiar enough with BrainGate 2 to, to really discuss it. Okay. Okay, I guess really? Wow, that was easy. So, ah, I can talk about wireless head stages because those are fun to talk about. So let me let me look up that URL, that link really quickly, and see if. So I still don't know enough about breaking two to really talk a lot about it, but I will comment on wireless head stages really quickly because they're real, they're pretty cool. Uh, they don't actually necessarily mean that you digitize on the head stage. You can still you can still transmit analog signals, which is what a lot of people do, and there are certainly problems associated with that. But it's still better to not. Uh, it, it frees you up in a lot of cases. It's less useful actually in human in, in human patients because they're still not going to be moving a whole lot. But one of the big uh, things that a lot of lab groups are working on right now is unrestrained recording. So instead of bringing a monkey down and having it sit in a chair for a while, uh, being able to just record it in its natural in its natural habitat for a, a long time and having it move unrestrained, which was something wireless technology would let you do. And there's a couple different groups working on this. Um, in the next, this is something that we know how to do. In the next five years, probably all head stages will be wireless. But right now, everyone's building their own. Also, this might uh, ease some of the, the need for omnetics. All right. So what, uh, if those are the questions, then I guess we're done. I'll hang around for a bit. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I guess now a few people can also switch the microphone back on. Uh, this looks really great, Doug. Of course, I look forward to seeing all these things uh, implemented in uh, commercial devices that we can buy at the local electronics shop. But I guess that will take uh, that will still take some time. Yeah, unfortunately. Although I, I, one of the things that I've become more and more convinced of over the past year is that the next generation of that the breakthrough recording technology is not going to be 
a electronics going to be uh, molecular. So it's either going to be a variation of optogenetics, or maybe not optical. So if you have radio frequency sense, radio radiation sensitive uh, surface protein or integral proteins, that uh, and then maybe you. I mean, well, so the problem with that is that you need to transfect the human, and that involves viral vectors, which is kind of a, an ongoing problem in in human research. But yeah, we'll either need to make surgery cheap, easy, and fast, or it'll have to be all molecular. And so, yes, we need to go that way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Also, it gives you much better get, gives you much better access to the cells, much better control over what you're targeting. Um, it could potentially be non-invasive. With if you have a big EM field, and then you have radio, uh, radio frequency radiation uh, sensitive neurons, then uh, then you could potentially even do it non-invasively once you figure out a safe way to transfect the the patient. So if there are no other questions, I guess uh, we can stop the oh, recordings yes. now. At least I'm going to stop mine here. <laughs>